that's good singing to start us go to number 95 number 95 at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away number 95 at the cross join with us as we sing alas and did my savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Was it for crimes that I had done He groaned upon the tree Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, is all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. We're going to open with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Brad Devine to come on up. He's going to pray for us here in just a moment. And uh, if you have a need, a burden, you can come. Lila, 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 you're all right. I'm not sure what's going on. She's okay. But if you, need, if you have a burden you'd like to come and pray for, I, let me share a couple quick prayer requests with you, if you would. Um, we have... And he's going, there you go. <laughs> the horrors of a six-year-old. Tough life, tough life. You'll be all right, Lila. Miss Judy will take care of you. Thank you, Judy. A uh, couple quick prayer requests uh, before Brother Brad uh, leaves in prayer. Uh, pray, if you would, for Brother Todd Miller. And uh, if you didn't hear, he had, a, had to have his gallbladder and appendix removed. I think it was on Thursday is when it got taken out. And uh, he's here. He's just not going to be doing too much moving. So don't come up and poke him in the stomach or anything, or else he may cuss you out. But uh, uh, no, he would. But uh, so we give him a prayer for that. Also, um, we've got a lot of folks out of town, uh, in particular uh, the Harmons, uh, Brother, Har Brother Rocky's at uh, Columbiana preaching this morning. And, uh, and so just be in prayer for him. And then also, for those of you who are, who are here Sunday night, uh, we had the Santiago's were with us, our missionaries to uh, the mm -hmm. Philippines. And uh, he announced to us that night, he said that they'd been praying that the Lord would, would uh, they'd been praying for a son. He announced tonight that they, that they just found out since they've been in the States that, uh, that they were going to have a baby. And this week on Facebook, he posted that uh, she went to, she was having some problems and they went to the doctors, and the baby was 12 weeks long, but no heartbeat, and had passed. And so be in prayer for our missionaries, uh, Genesis and, and Renzi Santiago, and just a, just a sad thing. I, if you would have saw, if you would have seen the joy in their eyes when he announced that they had just recently found out about that, and then, of course, like, like with anything, to lose a child like that, just be in prayer for them, if you would. So, Brother Brad, if you would come, and of course, pray for power on, God, on the service. And if you need to come to the altar, you're welcome to come as he, as he prays. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for just the opportunity to be in your house, to worship, Lord, to uh, come before you, Lord, with praises and thanksgiving, Lord. We do thank you for uh, just the uh, uh, weather that you've given us recently, Lord, and just pray that you would uh, use it for your glory, for your honor, Lord. We do think of uh, the Santiago family, Lord. Just pray that you would comfort them and give them that very special grace, Lord, that can only come from you. Lord, we do think of also just... 
uh, Brother Todd, that you'd continue to heal his body and, and uh, 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 just give him the strength that's needed. Lord, we think of uh, Brother Rocky Harmon as he's preaching today. Lord, pray that you just fill him with your spirit and fill, fill him with your power to be able to convey the message that you have laid upon his heart. Lord, we pray the same uh, for Pastor McLean here today as he preaches. Lord, just pray that you would uh, just lead and guide and direct him and, and give him just the spirit of God upon him, Lord, to, to preach all that you've laid upon his heart. Lord, we pray that uh, the services that we had of revival, Lord, would not have uh, burned down, Lord, but that we would continue to strive to uh, just uh, uh, be close to you, Lord, and to uh, be telling others about you, Lord. We pray that you would uh, move amongst us in our service today, that we could say, truly, we have met with the Lord. We pray now, Lord, that you would watch over in, in just uh, uh, a special way those that are traveling, the Fergusons and the Texters and those others, Lord. Pray that you would bring them back safely. And anybody that's not represented here today, pray that you would just uh, speak to their heart and give them a good day in you, Lord. We pray and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Stay standing. Let's shake hands. There's no choir today, so let's go and shake hands right now. Go ahead and play another chorus. And we'll shake hands, greet each other. Thank you. Be seated. If you would, find your places and be seated. 
Be seated and we'll do, do a couple, uh, let me give you some announcements here. Let me do, we'll do some announcements here and then we'll do another song before our offering. Um, just uh, in fact, what, go, ahead and, go ahead and turn to number 141 while I'm giving you these announcements, 141. And I want to remind you of a couple of things here. Uh, we have this Sunday night, or this, rather this Wednesday night is our nursing home ministry at Whitecliff. And uh, that's 7 o'clock, so we'll have service here or there. We'll be one or the other. Next Sunday morning, uh, the 24th, we're going to have, we'll have our regular Sunday school hour, have a regular morning service. And then afterward, we're going to just go on out this way. Rosie, behave yourself. Get in your own seat. That, that, that seat's not big enough for two. That's the, all right. And uh, the, uh, what's that? We're going to send her to the, we're going to have to send her to the behavior room or something. And just, uh, we'll have, after the morning service, we'll head out here. We'll, we'll be cooking some, grilling up some burgers and some, some hot dogs. And uh, the church is going to provide the, the hot dogs, the hamburgers, and the buns. We'll have big, 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 uh, cooler or big uh, whatever those jugs are called of uh, thermos jugs whatever was that whatever they're called I can't think of it that's terrible but uh, we'll have some tea and we'll have lemonade or things like that and we'll get drinks for that but if you need if you can come and stay we of course want you to stay and uh, we'll have you uh, if you can bring side dishes and or desserts one or the other or both you're welcome to and we'll just bring bring enough that we're all we'll share together we'll put out the tables I talked with uh, brother Ferguson we'll have some tents uh, this week to be able to have those set up so that way if the sun is too hot on us we got something to go underneath Lord willing it won't be raining and uh, if it does we could just always do stuff in here but but we'll have a good time for that and then also be in prayer two weeks from yesterday on the 30th we have a youth rally that we're hosting, and so be in prayer for all of that uh, coming up. And then Promotion Sunday, May 31st, and we'll take care of that. All right, let's sing, let's sing a couple verses of There is a Fountain, and then once we've done that, we'll receive our offering. 141, There is a Fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners blood beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Verse 3, if you would. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, lies silent in the grave, lies silent in the grave. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, share a couple other prayer requests that were just mentioned to me before we pray and then we'll have John Johnson uh, pray for the offering. Uh, a gentleman named David Light who is a good friend of, of Dave Marthy. Uh, he's, uh, they found some tumors, large tumors on his kidney and on one of his uh, main uh, veins or arteries going through there and we need to pray for David Light 
And then Ron, uh, Paf's parents, uh, their health is failing. He just asked prayer for strength uh, and, and for healing there. So, Brother John, if you would pray for these and then for our offering. Let's do some birthdays or some anniversaries. If you have a birthday today or this past week to recognize, anyone with a birthday to recognize? I'm looking. I see a few, a few hands, but none of them are really real. Uh, all right, what about anniversaries? Any wedding, wedding anniversaries to recognize this week? And I don't see any hands there either. All right, then. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and just uh, stand. We're going to sing number 310, The Solid Rock. We'll sing this, and then after we've sung, we'll dismiss our young people. 310, the solid rock. Join with it if you would. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand when darkness fails his lovely face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand on the last when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone on lester stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Thank you, be seated. We're going to let our young people be dismissed. Brother Brad and take the, the first and sixth graders downstairs. And then the three, four, and five year olds will go with Miss Sarah and Miss Caroline. We'll go ahead and let them be dismissed. Make sure you're walking, Seth. Walk, walk. 
The rest of you go ahead and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to be here. Let those young people get down there. Thank you again, Ms. Judy, for your help in that situation there. Second Peter chapter 1. One and two. Uh, uh, Rosie asked me if I could, uh, she gave this card. This is in particular to, I guess, well, my wife, all the ladies who were involved. Uh, just a thank you note letting uh, for all the uh, Things for the Mother's Day banquet said everything that was done at the Mother's Day dinner was greatly appreciated by all the moms, daughters, and other ladies that were there to enjoy it. Thanks so much for the Christian love. Your friend always, Rosie, and so uh, trouble, she says. But, uh, so just want to say thank you for that, and Miss Jamie, I'll give that to you a little later, and uh, you can pass it on even to Miss Shreya. Do pray for uh, Shreya and her and their kids. Our, uh, Logan and Lorian are all sick under the weather, and so they're at home today. And uh, just one of those, one of those weeks where... I, I, does, this, does this sound terrible? Uh, when I'm thinking as far as attendance is concerned, I praise the Lord that Brother Todd had, uh, had to have surgery this week so they could have their family still here for today for attendance. And now, just, no, just it, it's, a, it's a blessing when uh, we have, uh, I mentioned this last week, I think, or sometime throughout the last week, it's a blessing to know that we have preachers who are part of our church who are able to go out and be a help. And, and, uh, and so uh, be in prayer for the Millers. He, did, uh, he accepted the call to be interim pastor at Steel Valley Baptist down in uh, Brilliant, Ohio, and a church of about 15 people or so, 15, 20 people, and uh, just uh, be in prayer for them and for him as he, uh, they'll be traveling down each, each weekend for now. Um, one of the specific things, I mentioned this last week in the bulletin, but one of the specific needs uh, that they would ask prayer for is uh, for some way uh, of a place where they can stay down there, like on Saturday nights in particular, uh, whether it be a camper or something that they could find, uh, in exp- you know, reasonably priced and expensive or, or just something they can borrow for a while uh, to put there uh, down, down close so they can go. What, they, what they'd like to be able to do is drive down on Saturdays, be there to be able to go in the community and, and do some door knocking and, and help the folks with different projects and, and then also be able to spend the night and be there Sunday to preach. And so uh, we're just looking, out, looking for some different ideas. We've tossed around some ideas. It's all, it's all happened within the last week and a half. And so um, think something like maybe a camper or something, uh, pray maybe like if there's a uh, maybe a church we're going to try to f- see if there's any churches in the area that might have a prophet's chamber even if it's a half hour away that's a whole lot closer than two and a half hours and so uh, just be in prayer for all that if you would and we'd appreciate it all right uh, second Peter chapter one let's start in verse one and we're going to read down uh, through several verses we're coming back to our our series where we're uh, talking about growth we've uh, been in uh, for the month of April with Easter and with the revival and then of course last week being Mother's Day we uh, stepped away from this for a while uh, but we're coming back to this thought of, of part of our Christian growth and adding to our faith. But verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have tamed like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, amen, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the correction that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten what he, that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make, sure, make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord bless now as we take some time to look at this passage. I pray that you just give us uh, just a, a uh, understanding of what your word has to say. Lord, just speak to our hearts. Lord, be at the other uh, junior church ministries as they're going on. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today who's not saved, I pray that they'd come to understand their need for a Savior, that they'd call upon you uh, for salvation. Lord, help us. Help us to grow. Help us to be uh, more profitable for you. We ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have looked here again at that thought, starting in verse 5. Besides this, giving all diligence, meaning... Let's get to it. Let's, let's, let's get focused. Let's, uh, 
hop at it. Let, let's, let's be uh, purposeful about this. Add to your faith virtue. Now, faith, we talked about, is that faith that, of salvation. And we said that our, our faith, our saving faith, ought to be uh, not just faith that we, have, that we hold on to, if you want to say, by ourselves, to say, well, I'm saved, but it ought to be faith that is seen in action in our lives. Without, uh, without works, faith is dead. The Bible says that we ought to, because of our faith in Christ, because of our salvation, that there ought to be seen in our lives a, a Christian lifestyle that is different than what there used to be. There ought to be good works that are evident in our life because of our faith. Uh, so to add to our faith, virtue. And we said that virtue was, in essence, that moral excellence. Moral excellence, that we, when we get saved, we need to, to have moral excellence in our lives. And we looked at the things of, uh, uh, in, our, in our thinking, in our actions. We looked at that thought there in Philippians 4, where it talks about uh, what sort of things are true, honest, just. That list there in chapter 4, verse 8, and we won't go through all of it now, but, but uh, we talked about that those are the things that we are to think upon. Those are the things that we are supposed to use, if you want to say, as the prism to, uh, for our thoughts and our actions to be gone through. As we think about stuff, if we're, if we're going to do something, we need to think about it. Is this something that would match up as being true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, etc.? Uh, we talked about moral excellence, virtue. We said not only that, that you add to virtue, knowledge. And we said that knowledge is not just facts, but knowledge is truths that are established upon the principles of God's Word. Uh, we, can, we can gather what the world calls knowledge, but if it's not truth according to God's Word, it's just uh, that, the Bible says, that, that leads to ignorance. It causes us to err. Uh, we, we use the example, and, but there's so many examples, but we use the example of, of evolution versus creation. The Bible says God created everything, amen? Uh, the, the, the evolutionary uh, theory, or it's not even really, a, scientifically it's not even a theory, it's more of a hypothesis, but evolution says, well, there was a big bang and everything came along. All the effort, all the teaching, all the, quote, knowledge that's given to say, well, this is, the, this is to prove that evolution is correct, it goes contrary to the Word of God. It takes more faith to be able to believe their nonsense than what the Bible says. Science proves and backs the Bible, and yet when all that knowledge, quote knowledge, all that information that's given to people that goes contrary to the Word of God is just something that leads us into to error, to lead us into error and leads us toward ignorance. It is not true knowledge. We need to add to our faith true knowledge that comes from the principles of God's Word. The things that God has established, the things that God has set up. Uh, when, we, when we think about this, uh, it says not only that, it says to knowledge we are to add temperance. And that is, in essence, self-control. Self-control, that we ought to uh, have control of ourselves. We ought to be able to, in our attitudes, make sure that we control our attitudes. Uh, how many of you, well, I won't ask, uh, how many of you know people who have quick tempers? Yeah, and we got people pointing at each other. I'm not sure what that's all about. And, we need to watch out. We need to use temperance to be able to control things we need, in our attitudes, in our actions. And, and there's a negative, in, well, I get, there's a, we deal with against the negative and we deal for the positive. Uh, things like that if it's something wrong, we show self-control by not doing it. But if it's something that's right, we show self-control to say, you know what, I'm in charge to do, I'm in charge of myself, I'm going to, use control, and I'm going to use my time wisely, I'm going to use my talents wisely, and I'm going to put myself in the position to do the things that God would want me to do. Self-control as opposed to just laying around doing nothing. Uh, we talked about temperance. Uh, we talked about uh, patience. It was the last one we talked about. Patience was that cheerful endurance. Cheerful. Godly patience is not just getting through something, but it's doing it with a cheerful, godly, joyful attitude. Now, it doesn't mean that we're always happy. Listen, there are things that we, we, we talked about when, in, with patience that uh, the things that, some of the things that uh, bring about and develop patience is tribulation, the Bible says. Tribulation brings patience. I don't like tribulation. I don't like trials. I don't like hardships. None of us do, but we can go into them and come through them with the joy and knowing that, okay, if God, God has allowed this for a purpose, it's going to strengthen me. It's going to help me to become a better person, and so I can cheerfully endure as I go through this. Patience. And so now we come to the, the next thought. Of, uh, it says, add to patience. It says, godliness. Godliness. There at the uh, last part of verse 6. And I want to talk today a little bit about godliness. Now, the basic, if you want to say a general definition 
uh, Bible definition of godliness, just a simple one, would, would be to be holy. Holy. Godliness. Now, to be, godliness is the thought of being like God. Now, obviously, we are not, we are not God. We cannot, be, we cannot ever attain Godship, if that if that's, makes sense. But in his character, we ought to conform ourselves to what he is like. The Bible tells us in, in Romans 8 that, that, we are become, that God is conforming us to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That as part of being godly is conforming ourselves, in, as opposed to being conformed to the world, where we're told in Romans 12 not to do that, it's conforming ourselves to Him, becoming like Him, exhibiting the character traits that He has. Now, uh, let me say this, as, as part, part of this comes along, we've said it in the past, and I know I'm sort of, uh, I'm doing a lot of review because it's been over a month since we've talked about these things. But part of this just comes as we yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit as He teaches us this book. But through that, remember we've just talked about temperance, we've just talked about patience, we've talked about those kind of things. In order, to, as we're adding godliness, there are times that we are going to know we have knowledge, that's in that list, we know, okay, this, God is a God who is, who is kind. God wants us to be kind. And so if I, I have the knowledge, I have the ability, or I should have added to myself temperance, self-control to either be kind or not to be kind. If I'm showing self-control, I will be kind. Uh, I'm talk, we're talking about patience here and cheerfully enduring, even in times when we might not necessarily feel like being kind. Do you ever have those moments where you just, you, th- you hope to yourself, I hope nobody even talks to me because I'm about to rip somebody's head off. You ever have that day? Yeah. You bet. And uh, watch out for these folks. And uh, uh, godliness says we need to add godliness. And though it's a part of the Holy Spirit developing it within us, sometimes it's a matter of us saying, I'm going to take the knowledge that I've learned Use this self-control to exhibit these things in my life. And I'm going to continue on for God. I'm going to add godliness. It is a choice whether we are going to be kind or unkind. Now, as we add godliness, and this is just an example, obviously, with kindness. As we add kindness, as we add uh, compassion, as we add love in our lives, as we add the different attributes of God, mercy, forgiveness, things like that, as we add these things, and as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and they become a part of our life, they become what we would, we would say is second nature, but really it's part of our spiritual nature is what we are becoming. Uh, how many of you ever, maybe, maybe you struggled with, uh, I used temper a minute ago, was that, how many of you maybe when you were first saved or maybe when you were younger you struggled with your temper a whole lot more than what you do now? Now, what happens is usually as we grow, as we mature, both physically and spiritually, but especially spiritually, as we grow and we mature, we ought to have more and more control over that temper, right? And that's part of that adding, that godliness. And, and it becomes more and more what we term second nature, but really is that spiritual nature that we are allowing to be the primary nature over our fleshly Nature. Am I making sense this morning? All right. Uh, so when we think about godliness, it's it's being like God in His characteristics, uh, in 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 character, and we see that it's a thought of being holy. Now I want you to look at a few things here that uh, just sort of it's not introduction, but some principles about uh, godliness, and then we're going to see some three three uh, uh, commands that the Bible gives us about godliness. I want you first of all to see the pattern of godliness. There are four different verses that we're going to turn to. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4. We have four specific verses today that we're going to look at right now in this thought that tell us that we are to follow a pattern, that we are to follow the example that God has given us. Uh, Specifically, four different things that God has told us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, most of you have heard this verse. Many of you probably even memorized this verse. It says in Ephesians 4, 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now notice this. It tells us that God has set a pattern or example of forgiveness. He says, you need to forgive just as I forgave you. 
If we are going to have godliness in our life, there ought to be forgiveness shown from us to others. Amen? Just as God... Well, but preacher, you don't understand. They don't deserve it. Maybe not, but that's not the issue. The issue is, will you forgive? Did we deserve God's forgiveness? Nope. Never have. Never will deserve it. But praise God, by His grace and His mercy, He showed forgiveness to us. And we ought to have forgiveness toward others. Whether they, whether they ever take the steps to get it right or not, we ought to have that spirit of forgiveness. Uh, notice this, Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Again, we're going to move quick here on these verses. Luke 6, 36. We see another pattern, another example of God that He's given us uh, in the thought of godliness, a pattern of godliness as we copy God as our example. Luke 6, 36 says, uh, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. In essence, God says, I'm merciful. And aren't you glad for His mercy? Amen? He's merciful, not only through salvation, uh, sparing us of the, the, uh, the, the torment and the eternal uh, sorrow of hell, but He's merciful in our everyday life. He bestows upon us mercies. Anybody have to uh, have their car taken to the, to the mechanic this morning so you could get to church? Aren't you glad you went out, started the car, and it went just fine, right? That's by God's mercies. Well, no, it's because I have a good car. I'll give you an example. One week ago uh, on Sunday night, Susan Texter out there, they're getting ready to leave for their, their trip this week. And new, new Jeep within, you know, they've had it for maybe, maybe like four, five, six months. Goes out there, turns the key, click, click. Click, wouldn't start. We finally got it going, had to get a starter. She's still having problems. Well, well, what, what's the problem? Now, I'll say this. God showed mercy on her that she got it started. But I'm just saying this. It's not a matter of, well, I've got a new car, or I've got this, or I've got that. That's why it works. It's by God's mercies. It's by God's mercies. Now, when we think about this. He says, I'm merciful, therefore, be merciful. This pattern of godliness. We're going to be like God. We're going to copy him. We need to show forgiveness, mercy. Uh, Matthew 5 few pages back from where you're at toward the front of the Bible, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 5, chapter, or verse 48. Matthew 5, verse 48. Again, another example. God tells us to do something as He is. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, let's, let's not misunderstand this. When we think of perfect uh, in a, as a Bible word, it's, it's to be mature, it's to be complete. It's to be fulfilled, if you say it that way. Uh, we think oftentimes perfect meaning sinless. Uh, if somebody is sinless, they would be perfect. But perfect, in the Bible term, would be that thought of being complete, mature, full. Uh, that, that's why the Bible, if the Bible says, you know, we have to be careful sometimes. We say, well, I thought Jesus is the only one who's perfect. But then the Bible says Job was a perfect man. Uh-oh, we've we got to make sure we understand words. Uh, they were mature, they, they were complete spiritually, if you say it that way. And he says, be therefore perfect, matured, complete, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. God the Father embodies all. And he says, you need to grow, and you need to develop, and you need to mature and become complete, so that you can be like me. And then one other thing is we think of this pattern of godliness, of copying God, is in 1 Peter 1.16, think of holiness. Again, referencing godliness. Uh, 1 Peter 1.16, I'll read to you, it says this. It says, because it is written, in fact, verse 15 says, but as he which hath called you is holy, talking of God, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I, God, am holy. When we think of adding godliness, we, d we see the reality that God is our pattern. It is he who we are to copy. Four specific things that he says, but always, obviously, when we think about that, even that thought of being perfect, complete, that encompasses all of his traits. All of his, his now, uh, the, the things that, that are, are as far as his character is concerned, being just, being loving, being kind. Notice this, secondly, as we think about just some things, the, the appearance of godliness. Let me, let me read this to you. 2 Timothy 3.5 tells us this. 2 Timothy 3.5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, the appearance of godliness. Just because something looks like something doesn't mean that they are that thing always. 
Think about, uh, I, I remember when we, we lived in, in Florida when I was a little boy for a couple of years. And they had, everybody's probably seen or knows the, the, the chameleon lizards. You know what I'm talking about? And, you know, I was, let's see, I was 9, 10 years old when we lived in Florida. And, and lizards were right up my alley, you know. Uh, one ago, I remember it was funny, my sister Julie, we, we, we moved from Pennsylvania there. And, uh, of course, people say, oh, there's alligators in, in Florida. Well, my sister Julie, if I was 9, she was 6. And uh, one day, I don't know if you remember this or not, but she, she uh, comes running, screaming in the house, ah, what's wrong? There's an alligator! We go out, and it was a lizard about that long. <laughs> Six years old, she'd just been told there's alligators. You know. But you would find those chameleons that would be different colors based on the foliage around them or based on where they were at. And they appeared to be something that they were not. They would blend, oh, what's that? Oh, that's just, a, that's just a bush with some flowers. Well, it's not all just a bush with flowers because right there on that branch is a lizard that you wouldn't have never known. They appear like it, but it's, they're certainly not a bush with flowers. Uh, there are Christians today, and, and even those that are lost, there are people today who have a form of godliness. They put on an appearance of godliness. They portray as though they are godly, that they are holy, that they are right, but inside they are not. God is not saying, in this passage where it says, add to your faith all these things, including godliness, he's not just saying, make yourself look godly. Because we can make ourselves look godly for a while, but the only way to truly establish ourselves, and we, we didn't, I didn't focus on it this morning, but those last verses that we read there, a little further on down, talks about that as you add these things, it, it helps you to... Uh, to Make sure if you're calling your election to make sure of the fact that, yes, I am saved. It says that the people who don't add these things, that they will come to the place where they forget that they've been purged from their sins. They, they forget the fact of what God has done for them. Why? Because they've never added anything to their faith like they should. And there are people who will, who will portray godliness, but inside, oh, sorry about that. But inside, there's nothing there. And I say, well, how do we know the difference? Well, here's the, sad, the, the, the reality is this. Somebody who portrays God, godliness, eventually it catches up to them, and they reveal their true nature. They reveal their true nature. But those who add godliness aren't just putting on clean clothes. They've actually gotten themselves clean within. Make sense? I say that, let me say this as well. One, this is one of those things that we have to be with all of this stuff, we have to be diligent, it says, in adding these things in this regard, that it ought to be something that's done regularly, that we check up on ourselves regularly. Because just because you've achieved or have attained or added something doesn't mean that it's always going to be there if you just neglect it. I'm thinking of a Christian right now who, for several years, was in ministry, was a was used mightily of God. Was used ha, was was a godly person, was a godly example. And somewhere along the line, they got their own desires ahead of God's desires. Now they put on a good show for quite a while, but eventually, it caught up to them, and eventually, the the outward look of, oh, I'm godly became tarnished and eventually just obviously just cast aside when the true nature inside revealed itself. We have to be careful. It's not just putting on a robe of godliness that people look at us and say, oh, look how, look, look, look how nice they are. Oh, look, they say these kinds of things. We're talking about adding godliness within ourselves. Not just having a form of it, but adding it to our lives to please God. To become like God. Uh, notice this as well. Just again, some things, thoughts about godliness. Then we'll get to the practical application. Uh, so the people of godliness in God's word. The Bible says that they are, uh, the people of godliness are prayerful people. Uh, let me read this to you. Psalm 32, verse 6. They are prayerful people. The Bible tells us. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. He says those that are godly will pray 
unto God. You want to add godliness to your life? If you're adding godliness, you'll find yourselves being a prayerful person. Well, preacher, I pray for my meal. That's good, but that's not just... We're talking about a life of prayer. We're talking about uh, not just thank you, God, that I made it through the night. Not just thank you for my food. I'm talking about prayerful people who call on God uh, for communion, for, for, for needs, for praise, for worship. Prayerful people. As you add godliness to your life, you'll find yourself being more prayerful. Uh, not only that, the Bible tells us that it, here in uh, Psalm 4, I'll go there next. Psalm 4 says that godly people are set apart for His service. In Psalm 4, verse 3, it says, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. God says that when we are godly, we have been set aside. That, that, that's part of God. It's being set aside for His purpose. For His use. We have, let me just dump this over here so I don't dump everything out. We have these offering plates. Now, what is this offering plate used for? Somebody tell me. The offering. And give that girl a prize. <laughs> the offering. Now, wait a minute. Now, can the, could this be used to carry toys around? Sure. Could this be used even, I mean, it's got this felt in here, but I get, could this even be used to have a snack in there? Sure. Brother Kurt's been coming to church all these years waiting to be able to do it, too. Could, 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 this, could this even be used, and it might, it might have been one, as, as a part of a, a little boy's imaginary game as his helmet? Yeah. Could this be used as, now all, all the kids are downstairs, so I'm trusting that all of you won't do this. Could this be used as a Frisbee? Probably. Could this be used as a tambourine? Sort of. But what is this for? Offering. It's, it's set aside for a certain purpose. To be used of God for a purpose for the offering. When we are saved and we are godly, God, God says the godly are set apart for himself for his service. Now, you know, I, I can use my body just as this can be used for many different things. Most of those things are not necessarily what it's for. I can use my body for a lot of things that God might say, that's not what I created you for. But I want to do it this way. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but I created you for a certain purpose. You're, you have been set aside. As you add godliness in your life, you will find yourself being set apart for God's service. You say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. You're probably not adding godliness to your life. You're using your temperance, your self-control for the wrong reason. You're, you're not allowing God to, to work in your life. God, godly people are prayerful people. They're people who are set apart for himself. Uh, over in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, we see that godly people, uh, we don't like this one, but sometimes godly people are persecuted people. I don't know if I like that preacher. The Bible does tell us, I'm going to read this to you here, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, the, the good news is this. Jesus said, and I believe it was in Matthew, he said, Blessed are they when men shall revile you and persecute you. He says we're blessed. When, we've, when we're being persecuted or, or reviled because of our works for God, our stand for God, he says you're blessed. I don't feel blessed, well, God sees it, and he blesses you, and he will give you grace for the time, he will give you grace for the trial, he will bless you at times here on earth, and we're also establishing rewards in heaven for our faithfulness, even in spite of persecution. Nobody necessarily likes to be persecuted, but God says, it's all right if you're doing it for me. I see it, and you'll be blessed. You'll grow as a part of it. You'll have, you'll have my grace and your mercy. You'll see joy in your life as, as you yield yourself to me in spite of persecution. Godly people are prayerful. They're, they're set apart. They're, they're sometimes persecuted. And then in 2 Peter, it tells us that, that uh, they are delivered people. Let me read this to you. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, 
The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now think about that. Well, I, I, here we are, we're being persecuted, but God says, listen, I've, found, I, I've delivered a way for you to be, to be delivered from, from temptation. So, and I see the ungodly. I see what's, what they're doing. And one of these days, they will have their punishment. You know, we may feel persecuted today, but God says, it's all right. You'll be blessed for it. But those who are ungodly, God says, there's a place of punishment, a time of punishment for them. But I've delivered you. These are some things that we think about. We think about uh, uh, godliness, a pattern of godliness, that we copy God, uh, the appearance of godliness, that we, that we uh, are not chameleon Christians, but that we have not just an outward appearance, but we are actually adding godliness to ourselves. We see that the, the people of God are this way. Let me talk about the prophet of godliness. Prophet of godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we have a passage where, let me find it here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says this, For bodily exercise profiteth little. And all the ones who don't like to exercise, they always say amen there. Uh, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In chapter 6, verse 6, says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Profit. The benefits, the, the, the increase as a result of godliness. Verse 8 again, bodily exercise profiteth little. What, what he's saying is it's, it's profitable to, to exercise ourselves bodily, but it's only for this, this temporary time that we're here on earth, and our life is but a vapor. But godliness, it says, is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. It says bodily exercise, that thought of, of what we do in a physical form, it's only profitable for little because it's only in this, this time frame. You know, say, well, what if somebody lives to be 85 years old? That's eight, 85 years is about like this in the span of eternity. It says, it might be good for those 85 years, but it's still not like godliness. Godliness is profitable to all things, both during those years here on earth and throughout eternity. Throughout eternity. Godliness, it's profitable. It said there in, in chapter 6 that I read a minute ago, it said that godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. What does that tell us? That we ought to be willing to say, if I've received, if I've achieved, I don't, not achieved, if I've added godliness, if I'm becoming godly, that's good enough. That's good enough for me. That's great gain. In God's eyes, that's, that goes above and beyond. And we receive godliness with contentment. Now, three quick thoughts and we'll be done. And it's not even noon yet. We're doing good. Three quick thoughts. The Bible tells us some commands in regards to godliness. The Bible tells us, number one, to exercise godliness. We just read there in 1 Timothy uh, 4, verse uh, 7 and 8, in regards to the, the, the exercise of bodily exercise, profit with little. But notice in verse 7 it says, but refu 1 Timothy 4, 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now what does that mean? That means we do that which is right. We do that which is good. In, in 1 Timothy 2, 10, we have, it's in the context here of, of, of uh, ladies, but it says, but, parentheses, which becometh women professing godliness, and parentheses, with good works. Meaning, those that have godliness will show good works. Those who have godliness will show good works. Exercise godliness. Now here's the thing about exercise. To, to exercise something. We have to choose to do it. It's something that we choose. When we think about physical exercise, we all, deter, uh, we all determine to do it. Now, some of it is easier because you say, well, I have to get up and I have to go someplace anyways. And so we are exercising ourselves. But even then, we still, every day, have the decision to make, have the choice to make, do I or do I not get out of bed? Now, there are a lot of things, obviously, that are relying upon the fact that we get out of bed. But how many of you have ever had the day where you wished you could just stay in bed? Yeah, all of us. And yet, most times, what do we do? We get up. 
we exercise ourselves. We do the things that are necessary. But even beyond that, think about this. Just actual exercise programs. I remember when I was, when I was in college, the first time at community college, um, I was on the basketball team, and the, the coach said, we want everybody to try to, if they can, you know, lift weights and things like that. Well, I, I wasn't able to, I didn't have a schedule where I could really go to the weight room at the college. Uh, I had, I was, I was living at home, so I didn't have rent or anything like that. I had a little extra money, and I, bu I bought myself, uh, got a good deal on a, uh, one of those exercise, uh, not just free weights, but like an exercise equipment kind of thing, it had, where I could do bench press, I could do pull, pulling down, I could, I, could, uh, get all, I could do the legs, I, there was a section there where I, it was like stairs running on those, all those kind of things, a thing where I could put myself up and kick my feet up to work my abs, all that kind of stuff. And while I was 19, 20, 21, even almost going into 22, I used those things regularly. And I, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to get you know, big and buff or anything, you know, but I, I know you're surprised because I mean, I'm practically there anyways. But, uh, I wasn't trying to get big and buff. I was just trying to be in good strength. I loved playing basketball. It helped me for the basketball team. It helped me later on. Just I wanted to be able to do that, and I enjoyed it. Round 23, I, uh, we, we moved to, to Masson, Ohio to go to Masson Baptist College. And I wasn't playing basketball all the time like I had been. And uh, in fact, sort of tapered into going that, that, that summer before going to college. I wasn't playing nearly as much. And got there, and, and I couldn't bring my weights with me to go to college to live in a dorm room. So for that whole... From, from September till June, till May, I guess it would be, I didn't have my weight system with me. It was back at home. And so I got completely out of the practice. I came home that summer to get married. And we got married, and uh, we moved into our, our new apartment. And I brought my stuff with me that time. I had own, my own apartment. I brought my, my weight system. I put it out there. I had it in the room. But I'd been out of practice for almost a whole year. I'd been out of the, uh, the routine for almost a whole year. And I got it in there, and my wife says, do we really need all this in here? And I said, yeah, I'm going to get back into it. Okay. It, become one, it became one of the nicest clothes hangers. <laughs> well, it wasn't nice. It was convenient for me. Toss it, toss it. It became a glorified clothes hanger eventually. And I moved it from that apartment to... Uh, another house, and then we moved it to West Virginia and had it in my house there, and then eventually we were getting ready to move to Georgia, and she says to me, are we going to move this thing again? And I said, yeah, I've been thinking about that. And we ended up selling it. And to this day, I regret it. Yeah. We sold it. But here's the thing. I, in order for it to be, to, to exercise, and use it, I had to choose. And really what happened was I found a whole lot of other things that were more important to me than to exercise bodily on that machine. Now on a physical level, bodily exercise profiteth little. It's not necessary. But on a spiritual level, exercising ourselves with godliness is an important thing. It's profitable in all things, here and with what we're establishing for time to come. Think about the, uh, the story of the parables, the, the, uh, the parable of the talents. Remember when Jesus talked about how a, a, a king gave five talents to this one and two talents to this one and one to this one? And he said, I'll be going away. When I come back, let's see what, you, what you've done in essence. He comes back, the one with five doubled. He had ten. The one with two doubled. He had four. The one with one said, well, I knew that you were a, a hard master. I knew that, that, that if I didn't do something about this, that I would be judged for it. I said, I, and basically said, I didn't want to lose it, so I just buried it. And I've still got my one. I have to go. It's buried. And God says, hey, the one with five to five, five to ten, said, well done, a good and faithful servant. The one with two to four, adding two to four, well done. 
and, and notice this, he didn't, he didn't say that the one with five was better than the one with two. They just did what they, were, what they could do with what they had. The one with one didn't use it. Didn't, for the sake of this morning's message, didn't exercise his godliness. And God said, uh, you've blown it. You've blown it. We need to exercise godliness. We have to choose. I'm going to do this. And in a spiritual matter, the spiritual warfare that goes on around us, the spiritual warfare in our mind, the spiritual warfare in our bodies, in our flesh, we have to choose, am I going to exercise godliness and do what's right? Or am I going to just give in to the flesh and do what I think is better as opposed to what God would have me to do? Exercise godliness. Secondly, the Bible commands not only to exercise godliness, but it says to follow godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says this. For the, uh, Let's see here. I think it's, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy. Second, no? We'll find it here. Yeah, 1 yeah, first Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Now, to follow up means, in essence, to pursue, pursue or to press toward. To pursue or to press toward. We see the exercise, we need to choose to do so. In this thought of, of following, we need to pursue, to press forward. It takes effort. We, we're following. We're chasing after. We had uh, uh, a couple weeks ago on our, on, for our Tuesday homeschool activities, we had a, we had a field day. We, used, uh, we went over to Calvary Fellowship Chapel, and they let us use their gym. And uh, Pastor McGee and his family, they're, they're part of our homeschool group. And we had contests. We had races and all those kind of things that they do for field day. And it was fun to see because we had different groups. We had the, the ones who were anywhere like from four to about six, uh, that age group. We had some that were like seven to about 10 or 11. We had the other, others that were about 12 to uh, 15 is about where our young people are. And they would have races. And I'm watching, the, uh, I'm watching as these kids go. It was fun to watch the little group. You had Logan Devine. Logan, who, if you've talked to him in the last month, he got these new shoes, which are, make him super fast. I mean, I mean, he puts those things on, you can't hardly keep up with them. I mean, he'll tell you. He'll, let me show you how fast. Uh, you had uh, Micah, our little boy. Micah is not, uh, Micah is, is destined to be a lineman as opposed to a sprinter. <laughs> when it came time to throw in stuff, man, he could throw that ball. When it came time to run, I mean, they, they, they had, but he, I mean, he's watching. He's, I'm going to get, I'm going to catch up to him. He has no chance at all, but he, I'm going to catch up to him. Then you get to the ultra competitive group, the older group, and you have people like Jacob, and you have people like Caroline, and you have people like Hannah. All three of them are very competitive and very in, in their racing. And you watch, and they're not, they're, they're not looking at the wall to say, that's where I have to go. As they're running, they're looking for each other. And if there happens to be one ahead of them, they're not worried about the wall. They're worrying about, am I going to catch Jacob? Or am I going to catch Hannah? And they are pursuing after. And they are putting forth great effort to follow them. The Bible says to follow, to pursue, to press toward godliness in that list of things. We choose Yes, I'm going to exercise my goodness, but then we follow. We, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to just choose. I'm going to do it. My, my mother's here, and, uh, and she would remember this, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, she's, she's thrown it back at me a couple times jokingly in the past few years after having my own house and everything. One of my jobs was, being a, was taking out the trash. She would say, Jeremy, take out the trash. And me being a, a, a foolish teenager, I would sit there and try to, wait a little bit longer, and she'd say, didn't I tell you to take out the trash? And I would say this, this sarcastic remark, and, and she, they'd get after me about it. I'd say, well, in my mind, it's already done. I've already decided, I, I, yeah, I, it's done, but I had never actually got off my backside to go do it. And she'd say, you better get in here now, and I'd get up and do it. We can choose to do something. doesn't mean that we've done it. We can choose to do something, but it does not mean we have done it. 
We choose. I'm going to exercise godliness. We follow after. We pursue. We press forward. We actually get into action. And then, the result, Titus 2.12 tells us that we are to live godliness. Titus 2.12, we've looked at this passage before, teaching us that denying un- ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We say, I'm going to exercise this. I'm going to choose to do so. I'm going to build myself in godliness. I'm going to follow after it. I'm going to pursue it. I'm pressing toward the mark. And I'm just going to, as a result, live a godly life. We choose. We take a step. And we just live. We, now, notice, it doesn't say act godly. You see, do you understand the difference between acting and living? I have a friend, uh, that some of you know, uh, the Kukendals, Pam and Todd Kukendall, have been here uh, one, before, missionaries. They have a daughter who is uh, an actress. Uh, she's done a lot of like community theater, different things. But recently, she was uh, on one of those, I don't know what, what cable channel it is, but one of those uh, like true life story type kind of things where they dramatize what's taking place. And she was cast as a character in this story where she and she was playing a woman and whose husband, the two of them, were killed, uh, were, 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 were murdered, and they were talking about how, what had happened and how they caught him, all those things. And she put on Facebook the other day, she said, sometimes it's really hard, she goes, you wouldn't think it, but it's really hard to, to convince yourself everything is okay when you see your daughter murdered in front of you on television. Now, here's the thing. Her daughter, Audrey, was acting as this person who was murdered. Was, she, was her daughter Audrey really mur- murdered? No. Two totally separate things. It appeared to her senses as she's watching. You know, I, 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 can, only, I can only imagine. She's probably thinking, look out, look out! Oh, wait. It's just something scripted. It's not real. But it sure seemed real. Sometimes we will find ourselves, if we're not careful, acting godly, but not living godly. It's not the same thing. Well, everybody thinks that I'm godly. Just because somebody looks at you and thinks that you're godly doesn't mean that you are godly, because you can act pretty well. We, there, there's a guy that I just saw just recently. He went to college with us. He's a good guy. He made better first impressions than anybody I've ever, ever, ever met in my life. Bob Nix, you know. First impression, I mean, you meet this guy, and you'd walk out of the room after about a minute, and you'd think, man, that guy is just a great guy. Man, I'm glad I got to meet him. Until you got to know his character. Now, what, what, uh, he's a good guy, and, and since then, what, what we found out, what he, what he realized was he wasn't even saved when he came to Bible college, and later on he got saved, and his life's a whole lot different. But he could act a certain way at first. Man, you thought, this guy is, he, this is, this is a good guy, until you actually spent time with him. And you realize that who he was was not really what was initially portrayed. Y'all with me? And his character his inner character overcame eventually that which he at first portrayed. Christians, we might be able to put on an act for a while. We might look good on Sunday morning. We might look good around church people. We might be like that chameleon. We're around the other Christians, we're around other church people, and we look and we act and we sound just like them. Then we step out the doors. We find ourselves, maybe, regretfully, if this is the case, showing our true nature. The Bible says this. Add to your faith, bang, 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 
godliness. Godliness. When a preacher preaches godliness like this, it's not so he can say, you people are ungodly. It's so he can say, listen, there's, this is part of being a Christian. This is part of growing up. There's blessing in being godly. There, there, there's, there's joy in living like God and, and having godlike characteristics. Add to your faith godliness, and you'll find yourself at a place where you realize, I am truly saved. I am being used of God to help other people. Boy, glad I added it. Let's exercise our godliness. Let's follow after godliness, and then let's live it. Don't just act it, but live it. Become that person. As we stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed, thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I, I, I've shared a lot of Bible passages today. Lord, I thank you that, that your word gives us these truths that we can just reference place after place after place. Lord, we, we've, uh, we know that you are wanting us to grow as Christians, that you're wanting us to develop, that you're wanting us to mature, that you're, as you, we already said here, to, that we are to be perfect as you are perfect, complete. We are to be holy as you are holy. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us now in this invitation time. Lord, if there's someone here who's, maybe there's some areas of, of godliness where they've chosen, I'd rather do my own thing. I'd rather be with the ungodly. I'd rather be with, do, do the things that I feel are more important than the things that God would want me to do. Lord, I, I hate to see that in people's lives. I pray that if that's the case, that you'd just convict them and they would just get it right with you so they can have joy and peace in knowing that they're serving you faithfully. Lord, it might be that there's somebody today that, that they're not even saved. They don't even have that saving faith yet. Lord, if that's the case, I pray that they'd just come and allow us to show them from your word how they can know without a doubt they're on their way to heaven. Lord, we pray that you just use this invitation time for your honor, for your glory. As you've dealt with us, or maybe for salvation, maybe for baptism, for church membership, maybe just a matter on our heart dealing with the, the message, maybe just another burden, whatever it might be, as we use this altar, Lord, we pray that you'd work for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, music is playing. If you need to come and use the altar, why don't you come? If God's dealing with your heart about a matter, why don't you come? Already folks are moving. We have time. Come take your time and just do some business with God. Where are you in this matter of godliness? Where are you in this matter? Maybe it's God's dealing with your heart about, we talked about a lot of things today. Maybe there's something that a statement was made and God said, hey, 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 that's you, that's you. You need to pay, pay attention to that. Whatever it might be, as others are praying, if you need to come, why don't you come?